A wonderful intro, and thanks everyone for being here today with us. Um, Nick and I are super happy and excited to share with you a bit of a case study of Ogden College Hall, um, which is a building on Western Kentucky University's campus. Um, the learning objectives today are to understand the integrated design process, role, and design goals in designing a well V2 gold and lead gold building, which uses 50% um, less energy than a code minimum university laboratory. Um, two, to understand designing healthy, sustainable buildings are paramount to the mission of student success and safety through creating student-centered spaces. Um, to describe the synergy between lead V2, between well V2 lead and high performance design while maintaining a very tight budget, and uh, to describe scientific moments through art, graphics, and natural materials and how they contribute to well V2 and the health and energy of the building occupants. A little bit about the project background. Um, so, I just screwed that up. So when this building um, started, WKU um, had planned on renovating the existing Thompson Center North Wing, but after evaluating um, what North Wing was, you know, it was built in the 1960s and it was 69,000 square feet. And at the time it was lauded as being um, one of the most modern and well-equipped science buildings in the South. But over the next 50 years, it became very outdated. The laboratories were small. They didn't have adequate infrastructure for the technology and the equipment they needed in the new labs. So on top of that, um, it had become a very unhealthy building. So there was asbestos in the floors and the ceiling, the pipe insulation, the HVAC system didn't necessarily work properly um, to clear contaminants and get proper air changes into the building. And years of contaminants had built up into the acid waste piping. So the decision was made that a new building really needed to be put in its place rather than trying um, to use this building that had really become unsalvageable at this point. The new building would be called Ogden College Hall, um, and it is a very fume hood intensive uh, building. It has 104 fume hoods. It's four stories, 82,900 square feet. It costs $32.5 million, and that's in construction cost. Um, this building was a part of a bigger project cost that included the renovation of a 1970s Thompson Center, Cent Thompson Complex Central Wing and um, the renovation and structural stability of their hardened planetarium. Um, for, but this building came out at $392 per square foot, which um, for 104 fume hoods was really a, a shoestring budget. We would have expected it to be more of about $600 a square foot. Um, from the beginning, it was really important that this was a place for student success and student learning and that they were kind of the key factor in the programming. Um, but it was also going to need to be an energy efficient building. So that and making it a success for students were kind of paramount in the beginning of our discussions. Um, the focus on the students really included understanding students today. You know, students today really expect their buildings to be sustainable and have um, recycled products and the ability to recycle and bottle filling stations. Um, you know, they, and they expect instant access to everything. So it had to have the technology they need to be able to get on their computers anywhere in the building and gather um, and have spaces that could be, you know, quiet study spaces for individual study as well as kind of group study. Um, for them. The faculty really wanted to make sure that every inch of this building could be used. They didn't want atriums because any place they see an atrium on campus and other buildings or in fancier buildings, they always felt like that could just be more lab space and lab space really was important to them. When we began programming, they had a long list of labs that they wanted to have in their building and you know, they really couldn't figure out how they wanted the adjacencies of those labs to work. So we went through this programming exercise 
where we allowed them to start thinking about what labs they want together and where those labs should be in a four-story building. And what we discovered is that by doing this, they were able to dis, um, discover ways to really create discipline, uh, multidisciplinary study areas and joint and shared labs. And we were able to reduce the number of labs. Um, for example, both biology and chemistry wanted a materials lab. And rather than doing two separate materials lab that would have been two full-size labs, they were able to combine that into one lab that was, you know, one and a half times the size and was adequate for their needs. Plus it made sure that students um, and teachers and faculty from different disciplines were working together. Um, and they wanted no wasted space. Um, in addition to be flexible, um, this process made them realize that if they put all their research labs kind of in the core and middle of the building, then as grants change and faculty change, maybe some of those research labs would be for biology, maybe they would be for physics and astronomy, maybe they would be for chemistry. And so that really allowed this building um, to be flexible for, for, for future needs. So energy was a major focus uh, when we started to look at this building. You can see the graph on the left here um, that has your baseline uh, energy use intensity or EUI for different types of buildings and all the way down at the bottom you see food service which is obviously a very high user of energy at just over 250 EUI and when you see the graph on the right this is a graph of just some of the tracked buildings of lab buildings you can see that some of them are operating up close to a thousand EUI and a majority anywhere from 200 to 600 so you can see that you really, we really need to focus on the energy of this building uh, to reach the goals. And we're happy to show our little dot down there at the bottom uh, operating at a, around 167 DUI. So at the start of this process, we began with a typical integrated design, which you have, obviously you're gonna kick off, you're gonna do programming with the owner, um, and then start to look at goals and setting those goals at the very beginning. Um, and one of those goals is lean as required by the state of Kentucky. Um, and so you get through the checklist. And um, so that was our goal throughout the design process. But with this project, it was a little weird as actually after substantial completion was when our office really started to look at well and how can we start and focusing on the health of the occupant? How can we start pushing this? So looking at this project, we proposed well to the university. At first, there was some pushback, like where are we going to get the funding? We don't have the money to do this. And as we started to look at it, um we said well just let us look at it. let's do the go through the well checklist see where we have some points that are low cost and um so went through the charrettes and making assignments um and one of the largest things that drove us to do this was kentucky changing its law happened right around this time to performance-based funding for universities so and the way that is looked at is based on retention and recruitment of new students and the university saw this as a great PR, a great marketing opportunity to sell a well laboratory. And in the times we're living in with COVID, it's, it's just now just becomes even more beneficial to help sell this to future parents and future students that they're sending their students to this well building and help, help the university combat decreasing enrollment. At the start of the project, it's, it's very crucial that all stakeholders are involved on the design team, on the owner side. Um, in order to set these goals and make sure that you have champions. Um, whenever we're looking at a project, we want to find on the owner side a champion that is passionate about the project and is going to push the, the project forward to meet the goals we have. For this project, we had Dan Cheney, uh, the project manager with Western, who was our lead champion and budget and schedule with just the constraints we had on the project 
And actually even more important with starting wells so late in design, we really needed a champion for our well initiative and which we found that in Dr. Stevens. Um, so she was very crucial in pushing um, this goal we added. And in parallel to your owner champions, you have to have the champions on the design team. For this project, we had our lab designer who was crucial with meeting with owners and making sure they got the building they wanted and the users. Um, we had, and then Sarah as the architect was our lead champion and the lead project administrator in pushing that forward and reaching our goal of getting, actually that was registered for silver and we were able to push it and get to gold. And then us as the engineer, as the well administrator and so having those on both sides really helps drive you reaching your goals. If you don't have everyone on the team striving to reach those goals, it's unlikely to, to reach those. So as we mentioned, this building is lead and well, and we want to talk a little bit about um, what that means. So starting with lead, not changing for me here. I had that issue a little bit too. <laughs> um, all right. So of course, like we mentioned, um, this was always going to be a lead silver project and we managed to push the envelope and get it to be lead gold. And that was a requirement from the beginning, not only because of Kentucky state law, but also because it was a priority for Western Kentucky University. Um, they had started certifying their buildings lead um, before it was a state law and they continued that happily with the state law. And as Nick mentioned, we came to well late in the um, a little bit late, but because of the decisions we made to go lead, they really did pair up with our, um, some of the well points that we went over. Um, this is the lead checklist. We ended up with a total of 66 points for lead and everyone's familiar with this, so I'm not going to go over it, but I do wanna point out that we got 15 points for our optimized energy performance and we did not sacrifice the outdoor air um, delivery monitoring and or, I'm sorry, the increased ventilation point um, to get those 15 because we knew we wanted both for a lab building. And because we really did go for the increased ventilation and all of the IEQ man management plans and low emitting materials during lead that really helped us with our well submittal um, when we made the choice to go there. This is the well checklist. As you can see from this checklist, there's a lot more items on here. And um, well is really divided into 10 features. And those features are listed here on the right. Air, water, nourishment, light, movement, um, thermal comfort, sound, mind, and community. And well is all about human comfort and it understands that spaces can really and truly enhance the health and well beings of, of, of humans. And also it affects our behavior. So we want those buildings to be working for us in a positive way to give us more energy and not in a negative way um, that, you know, makes us sick or this, um, you know, sick, I guess. <laughs> um, it is also important to point out here that we did do Well V2, which is kind of and still is in a pilot program. Well V1 is very focused on offices and standards that are based out of California. And if we had stayed with Well V1, it would have cost the owner a lot more money. But by going to the Well V2, it's a much more flexible program and gave us a lot of ways to think about um, alternative path methods, um, paths to get. Um, to get these uh, points. And well is there's optimizations, which are the ones you choose to get and they're the preconditions um, that you have to get in order to achieve well. So then it's kind of talked about it a little bit with the synergy between lead and well, and these are actually called crosswalks, which some of the points for well you automatically get just by doing lead. And then some of them, it's just a small lift or small change to get those points in well. For example, if you look, well has smoke-free environment. That's directly correlated to environmental tag with tobacco smoke. 
the fundamental air quality is very similar to minimum angle air quality. Increased ventilation is very similar to enhanced ventilation. Some of the requirements for thermal comfort for the occupant are very similar. So when you're doing lead, there's a lot of points that you can just very easily get in well if you just start to look at what you're already doing to lead. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention about well certification is unlike LEED, it's very owner driven in a lot of ways. So on LEED, you know, we kind of build it, we design it, we get it certified and we walk away and you have a LEED certified building. With well, oftentimes the owner may need to make some policy changes about, um, you know, what they have in their vending machines, for example, because there's a whole se section on nutrition and you're you can't have sugar-based drinks and sugar-based snacks in those vending machines. So those are policy changes um, that the owner has to make. Um, in addition, well, you do have to recertify. So you don't just walk away from a well building. You're required to really make sure you keep up the standards for three years and then you have to recertify. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about the synergies um, between well and lead. And these synergies, um, you know, sometimes they complement each other between well and lead. Sometimes they build on each other. And sometimes they take parallel paths to really create a better and greater sum of the individual elements. To focus our conversation today, we're really just gonna talk about four synergies. And those synergies are energy and safety, air quality and um, health, water and well being, natural light and energy. So this first synergy, energy and safety, is, both of these things are very, very critical for a lab building. As we've talked about the, the high energy use of a lab. And then also the chemicals that are in a lab. Um, and whether there's a spill or you're sitting in front of a hood, there's different things that, need, extra things that need to be designed into a lab to make sure it's safe for the occupant. Uh, one of the things that we looked at on this project that was, a great synergy between these two things was going to a 12 inch sash height. The st industry standard is 18 inches. There was some initial pushback by the lab planner and the users, but we showed them, like, as you can see in this graph, that five foot four is your typical female and five foot 10 is your typical male. Both of the average female and male can easily work in this 12 inch sash height that's shown. But you can see that if you've got someone that is maybe a little smaller than the average female or has got a short male, um, if you increase that height up six more inches, their face is almost inside the hood. So lowering that sash height really increases the safety of that occupant. But at the same time, it's saving energy because we do not have to exhaust as much energy using a lower sash height. This was one of the great synergies that we found at the start of the project. And as we started to look at this building, we really wanted to identify what are the energy drivers? What's using the most energy in the building? And we really found that there was three different kind of types of spaces we were able to lump these into. The lowest energy use is your loads driven, which is your typical building whenever you're looking um, at determining cooling loads, what's in the space, how many people, equipment, and then as you, the next step up, you have your air change driven, which is requirements based on the lab and changing out the air as much as possible just to keep, again, keep any that's contaminants that might have spilled that those air changes are changing out quick enough. And then the highest energy use is fume hood driven. And as Sarah has already stated that this is a very high fume hood intense building. And taking and kind of stepping into that a little further, you can see from this graph, actually, whenever I went through to calculate, this building is actually 45% is labs. And I first looked at it, it was like 45% does not seem like that much to me. But when you, this graph really shows that pretty much the majority of three of the floors and a large portion of the fourth was all labs. Um, really driving energy in this building. And then another step further, um, which was very high, is 104 fume hoods, 610 linear feet, which are all consistently exhausting out of this building. 
So anything we could do to reduce energy at the fume hoods was very critical for this building. And one of the things that we were able to do by decreasing the sash height, we could decrease, save energy on our first cost with our mechanical system, but then also pay for auto closers for the fume hoods. So that any time an occupant walks away from a fume hood, it automatically closes, making it safer for the occupant, but at the same time, it goes to an unoccupied rate and lowers the energy use. The next synergy that I'll be looking at is air quality and health. And like I've said, that there's a lot of contaminants with its chemicals or formaldehyde or different things that can be harmful um, to the occupant is in a lab building. So we wanted to make sure from the start that we weren't adding extra contaminants to the building. So that came down to material selection, which, which is drove us to go towards the low emitting materials for lead and getting those, then getting those points for well. We also did a building flush out, which in this building became a lot simpler with the high outside air requirements. And then also we consistently do testing. Um, as a part of the well certification, there actually is a, a GBCI um, employee comes out and measures the air quality contaminants in the building. And then as actually as part of the one of the alternate compliance paths that we did, instead of doing annual testing, we've actually created an air quality cage that the, one of the employees moves around the building so we can get a true representation of what is what the contaminants are and it saves a, decent, a significant amount of money each year for the university as opposed to having to get third party testing done. This is a picture of the typical layout of the building or a typical lab and if you can kind of see up on the right side towards the front of the class the lab is is where we're bringing outside air into the space and then all the hoods are located towards the back. So this was just intentional layout of the lab so that we could provide the fresh air directly over top um, the working tables at the front of the classroom and pull all those contaminants towards the back. This is actually a graph from some of the data from an air quality cage. The two lines of WKU biology and WKU chemistry are from um, this actual building using the air quality cage that we put together for the university and actually comparing that to what a typical office building looks like and what a well office building looks like. This one's looking at PM 2.5. One of the really interesting things we noticed for this lab building when looking at this graph that shows TVOCs is kind of the inverse relationship of the TVOCs for a lab versus an office building. You can see that the office building with the blue and the green for even the well and the typical office building is it's low during unoccupied hours and as people come into the space and it starts turning things up and people are there, you can see the TVOC is rising. But then the lab building in the orange and purple, we actually have unoccupied rates during unoccupied times again to save energy. And then as you go to an occupied rate, you can see that the actual contaminants are dropping through the occupied time, the most important time when occupants are there, balancing the energy and air quality for the space. And so one of the things with air quality and energy, which Sarah kind of touched on with going, getting so, so many energy points, but also maintaining our ventilation was finding a balance between energy and indoor air quality. And one of the things was we've talked about is the fume hood auto closers and those sash stops is that's lowering energy, but also increasing the safety of the occupant. Um, and one of the things we also implemented at the hood, you can see over here to the right, is some signage on the fume hoods, which show as you get lower, it gets green, you're saving energy and it's safer. As you increase that sash height, it uses more energy and it becomes less safe. Um, this was used at UC Davis. Um, one of the other balances of energy and air quality was having unoccupied rates for the fume hoods and then also in the air change driven room, which we saw in that last graph is save energy when in users aren't there, but make sure we have a safe space when they are. And one of the things different we did here, which was used extra energy is 
Fumewood cabinet, storage cabinets are not all required to be exhausted, but we opted to do that just to make sure we had a safe environment. And one of the ways we mitigated some of those extra energy uses by bringing them all into one uh, central location where chemicals are not stored throughout the building all the time. It's all located in one central storage area. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the synergy of water and well-being. Um, this is one of those synergies that kind of run parallel. Um, you can't get a lot of water points in well because of what you did for LEED because LEED is really about reducing water use and making sure that any water that rains, for example, that you're bringing, you're treating and returning to the aquifer on site rather than um, shipping it up into the, the, the sewer. Um, and low flow to toilets and that kind of thing. Well is really about drinking water quality. Um, you know, it's really important that humans consume adequate amounts of water um, and well wants to encourage additional water intake because water has such positive effects on people. It transports nutrients throughout our body. And I'm getting a call, sorry. <laughs> Um, it transfers nutrients through our body, it uh, regulates our body temperature, and it removes toxins from our body. Um, and we lose water all through the day through sweating and, and respiration. So we want to make sure that we're adding that back into our body. And that's what well really focuses on, because the effects of dehydration are diabetes and obesity, and we want to prevent that in people. Um, also, when people don't like the water they're drinking, so Well thinks about um, treating the water so that it tastes good, because if people don't trust and think the water's contaminated or don't like it, then they start going and drinking sugar, sugar drinks, and we, we want to encourage the use of water. The other way Well deals with water is in the building envelope, so there is a specific point in Well where you show how you're putting in the proper um, water barriers, air barriers on the envelope so that you're not drawing that water through the envelope and ending up with mold and causing, um, you know, toxic, sick, sick building syndrome and things like that. Some of the things we did specifically in our building in this regard um, is we do have bottle refilling stations um, and that is great for students because they love to be able to fill up their bottle, carry their water with them. Um, that's particularly great today because, you know, and of course we have a water cooler right next to it. But, you know, we want people using that refiller now rather than, you know, putting their mouth and face down into a, a shared water cooler. Um, we also tested for contaminants in the water. And we were able to get an alternative compliance path for this as well, where we worked with the city of Bowling Green and got their testing metrics at the source. Um, and we're able to submit that to well for certification rather than paying somebody to come in and test the water on site. And we were able to do that because we knew there was no lead piping between the source of Bowling Green and we had none in our building. So that source testing um, sufficed and did save money for this owner. Um, another thing to think about, um, one of the things we did for LEED was we had a drain back tank in the bottom basement mechanical room for the cooling tower, so we weren't wasting that water. Well, stagnating water um, often has legion Legionella bacteria in it, and uh, cooling towers are actually the lead spreader of Legionella, so there had to be a Legionella plan um, associated with making sure that that water um, stays safe and doesn't cause Legionnaire's disease in any of the occupants. And another thing I want to mention is hand washing as a part of well. And I think this is particularly important right now as we're thinking about COVID-19 because all of us are probably washing our hands more than we have ever washed our hands before. Every time we touch something, um, anytime we go to a store, we come back after we unload our groceries, you know, we're washing our hands, washing our hands. Um, and so clean hand washing stations are also a part of well and they're really important. So well thinks about the fact that um, hand washing is the number one thing you can do to stop the spread of disease. And so they want you to have 
um, hands-free, touch-free hand washing stations. They want to make sure the sink is deep enough or the water stream is tall enough so that when you're washing your hands, you're not touching the sink bowl because that's going to be dirty. Um, and then using paper towel rolls to dry, to dry your hands as opposed to um, hand dryers because people tend to be not like hand dryers. And if you don't dry your hand properly, your hand is more likely to get reinfected with disease. So, you know, that's part of the reason hand washing is so successful for staying off COVID and um, why it did make it into well. The other um, synergy I'm gonna talk about is natural light and energy. And these kind of complement each other. So LEED really deals with natural light because it improves the kind of interior quality of a space when you have sunlight and natural light getting into a space. But it also contributes to energy savings when you're not having to put a lot of uh, lights into a space um, into the classroom. Well really looks at natural light and says that natural light is optimal for visual and mental and biological health. So they're looking at light exposure, stimulating the circadian um, system in our body. And that starts in the brain and um, you know, works through our body to open and regulate physiological rhythms throughout our body, such as tissues and organs. And that even affects like our sleep-wake sleep -wake cycles and our hormones. And in the human body, that's a 24 hour cycle um, and it's called the circadian rhythm. So a lot of times, and I know that it seems like circadian rhythm is kind of the, the it word right now since well kind of entered the system, but it's really important to how our body functions. Um, you know, disorders from not having adequate sleep include diabetes and depression and too much light at night, which also disrupts the circadian rhythm. Um, you know, people don't sleep well and they, it even has been known to cause like breast cancer. So we wanna make sure that the buildings we have have smart circadian rhythm um, lighting to, to really, you know, wake students up. The other part of that is these students are working in labs, which means they have chemicals um, when they're in the chemistry labs, they might be mixing things on the table before they move it over to the fume hood. And we want those students to be awake when they're performing these experience, uh, experiments because that's the, the safe way to do experience, experiments. Um, and that even like in biology, if you're dissecting something with a really sharp knife, you don't want a student nodding off. So you want to make sure that they're getting the benefits of that natural light. Um, at Ogden College Hall, we did put large windows in. And this is kind of an interesting story because as the architect, I wanted those windows to be bigger, bigger, bigger. And CMTA was telling me, you can't have 11 foot, 12 foot windows because we need the ceilings to be at 10 feet or we're going to be wasting a lot of energy because of how much energy we have to exhaust, how much air we have to exhaust the fume hoods and um, make up air we need to bring into the space. So we really want those ceilings to be at about 10 feet in order to conserve energy. And so our solution was to put the ceilings in at 10 feet, but then slope them up at the window in order to allow those windows to get bigger and brighter and bring more light into the room. Um, in this particular lab that you're seeing, there's actually 14 fume hoods in this lab, which is a lot of fume hoods. And we made the decision to make them glass, black, glass backed. So the light from the windows could continue to get into the space and it wouldn't be blocking the space. But also it's gonna allow you to see through the space. So if you're at one fume hood on one side of the room and somebody gets hurt on the other side, you see them, there's, there's visual access to all the students throughout the space. This is the model that CMTA submitted for WELL to show how we were getting natural light into all of the spaces to meet their requirements. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can meet the requirement in WELL and modeling is one of them. And all the areas you see in the, the kind of purple blue below are not getting natural light. And we made sure that programmatically, those were spaces that didn't need or more importantly, did not want natural light. So those are the labs that have things like the laser tables and the collection spaces. Um, the, 
there's a little diagram of the eye here, and that's really kind of showing how the circadian rhythm works. So light enters our eyeball um, through the retina, and it hits the cones and the rods, and that those are what allow us to see, but it also hits the intrins intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And those are ce um, cells that don't contribute to vision, but they do facilitate the circadian synchronization um, and other non-visual responses to light. Um, and, you know, again, natural light, sunlight is, is the best way to kind of get that healthy circadian rhythm. So here we are two years later of operating this building and we really, whenever we design a building, we always want to go back and see how are we actually performing? We did the energy model, but how is it actually performing? And this data that we go after is what drives our design in the future. It validates those decisions we made early on and are those really saving us energy? So this is a chart showing the energy usage for every month throughout the year as we track this for the first two years compared to our designed energy model. Uh, the, a typical lab building as the, at the AIA 2030 baseline is 370 EUI. So this building is actually operating at 50%, 56% less than a typical uh, baseline lab building. So this just validates what we have been designing and trying to show that we're trying to reach those goals. It just it drives what we do. So beauty and design and science on display were big aspects at the beginning of design and, and a part of our programming. And from the beginning, in order to express science on display, we came up with some thematic kind of art ideas that also express science. So on the uh, ground floor, which is where the biology, most of the bio biology labs are, um, we used fractals. And we used fractals because they're found throughout nature um, in snowflakes and galaxies and seashells. Um, and they're the foundation of DNA. So it was a nice way to kind of express that there's biology taught on that lab, uh, on that floor. Um, moving up to the first floor, we use molecules and sine waves because scientists use sine waves all the time to um, learn about light and sound and molecules and they're found throughout, um, found throughout nature as well. And then the um, third and fourth floors had molecules and atoms and hexacons as a theme because those are really kind of the building blocks of, of everything we do. And um, hexagons, of course, are found in tortoise shells, um, the Giant's Causeway in Ireland, which is a really cool um, stone place that has these hexagon stones that just stick out of the ground. Um, and, you know, they also carbon. Is looks like a hexagon, so you know it's it's everywhere. Because we had this as kind of the base, when we decided to do well, it fed really easily into some of those well features um, for community. For example, you have to integrate beauty and design, and we get a point for that. And in mind, there's this idea of access to nature. So by replicating some of those things that are in nature, um, we were able to get those points. And those are carried out through the student gathering spaces. Um, so you can see the hexagon floor tile pattern and even the chairs kind of begin to have a hexagon shape to them and they're very flexible and students can move them around to be in the space. On the left hand side, you see another study lab and you can kind of see a DNA um, soffit with rotating light fixtures going down the corridor and also starting to enter um, introduce natural features. So we have wood on the wall there, which is a cypress tree that we actually had to cut down, unfortunately, um, but we harvested it and used it as a way to warm up spaces throughout the building. Um, in another um, gathering space, it was important to have um, 
large graphics that students could use to study and also express what was going on, on the floor. So this is the evolution, sorry, the macro evolution of a tetrapod um, on the wall. So you can see how that's forming. And then you can see again, kind of this idea of that fractal of those um, triangles occurring in the, the custom ceiling panels and lights. We also want to make sure as a part of well that you kind of create wonder through the space and you want to um, make people want to move through the space by um, creating kind of aesthetic circulation network. So this is a large graphic that's 145 feet long and it starts down at the end of the corridor and it's a planetary evolution graphic. So it starts in the arcane age and it moves through um, the different eras of earth, the mass extinction. And you can see when you finally get to the end of this corridor, kind of where humans show up. Another way we wanted students to explore the building um, is on the third and fourth floors, the periodic elements are scattered um, throughout the ceiling tile in different labs and corridors. And you can go around and start to find those um, as a way to get to learn your periodic elements. Um, the periodic table was really important too. So in this study room, students um, can look at the, ta the table while they're studying and really get to know what's going on. Um, with, sorry, they can study the elements and, and use them as a part of their educational process in the building. Um, we also included those graphics into the circulation space um, in the stairways. So in periodic um, elements, you spell out WKU and Ogden. And this helps because you want to encourage students to use the stairs through the building. So you don't want the stairs to be closed off with no windows, but by adding the art and adding large windows, it encourages students to use those, um, use those stairs and make decisions about using the stairs. And Will also wants you to create a sense of community in the art you create. So on the left, on the exterior of the building are some over, oversized Kentucky symbols, such as the Viceroy um, butterfly and the tulip pop poplar. Um, up in the corner, you'll see the gray squirrel and the gray squirrel is the Kentucky game animal, which makes me a little sad, but that's what it is. And in, in uh, Bowling Green, um, they have the white morph gray, gray squirrel, which is a rarity kind of around the country. So the white squirrel has kind of become an unofficial WKU logo. So not only are we placing um, this graphic in the state, but we're specifically placed it in Bowling Green by doing the picture of the white squirrel. Um, they also really encourage local artists to contribute to the art in the project. So. I didn't have a better picture of this, but down here is an art installation by an artist named um, Christina Arnold, and it's called Incubate. And it's a really cool art piece where she's blown these glass pieces and they almost look like amoebas. And by having the lights, lights on them in different directions, they cast these wonderful shadows on the wall um, and are, are, are really contribute to the feel of the building. Um, and we also did other art like this piece, which is a perforated metal backlit panel where we did a cus custom, grasp custom design that starts as a solid at, a bottom, at the bottom and shows how water might transform from ice into liquid and then into to gas as those particles separate. Um, one of the professors liked this pattern so much uh, we gave her the uh, we gave her the AutoCAD file, and she turned it into a custom fabric that she made a dress out of, which I thought was a lot of fun. A big part of Well is really the signage. Um, they want you and people in the building to understand that this is a healthy building for you. So we did custom signage throughout the space that showed you know, why it's important to have light, um, why it's important to ride a bike. Um, and each of these at the bottom, you can see they're associated with different well credits and there's a QR code. And those QR codes will either take you to 
the well page so you can learn even more about why these are important, or it will take you to a WKU health and wellness page so you can see what WKU is doing to encourage health and wellness. At each of the stairs, I mean, I'm sorry, at the elevator, we had to put the sign that encouraged people to take the stairs. So where I talked about before how we wanted those stairs to be welcoming, at the elevator, we're giving you reasons to take the stair and say, you know, you can, you know, burn calories and, you know, maintain healthy bones and muscles by walking up and down those stairs rather than taking the elevator. Um, and then there's some, these are a couple of the other signs that we provided. Um, I like these signs because we, they are custom signs. We designed them specifically for Ogden College Hall, but they are also um, printed on paper and put into an insert on an acrylic panel. So as we learn more about how to make buildings healthy and, and um, for people and learn more about what water or sunlight might do, these graphics can be replaced um, into the future. Nick talked a little bit about how the building was performing from an energy standpoint, and we're really happy to see that it is performing um, above where we thought it would be and what we designed it to be. But on top of that quantitative analysis, we also like hearing from our students and teachers um, about how the quality of the building is. So we do go back and we did ask um, faculty and students how they are liking the building. Um, you know, one professor said that it's attracting potential new faculty members, it's bright, open, clean sight lines. And some of the students said, you know, it's intentionally interesting and creatively comfortable, excellent for education, suburb student and um, study and welcoming to work in, um, faculty friendly but student centered and a comfortable place to learn and a splen splendid place to work. So we were really happy that we're getting positive comments from the students and the faculty that have continued to use this building and have been in there for two years now. So as a design team, we really wanted to take these quotes to heart because this is this is how we move forward as a community. And so uh, if your project is going lead or well, uh, we just leave you with one question. Why not both? And that's the end of our presentation. So if um, anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to try to answer them now. So uh, Sarah, Nick, we'll hang on for a second. I don't see any questions yet, but um, we do have one comment some, um, from Jacqueline Whitaker, just kind of commending you guys on the project, saying not only was it the first well certification in Kentucky, one of the first higher ed projects, and one of the first lab certifications globally. So they, she just noted that's very incredible. And I want to thank you guys. I feel like it's been such an interesting presentation. I've learned um, not only about architecture, but I feel like some biology and some geography. It's it's been awesome. Um, so we'll, we, if you don't mind, we'll hang on another minute or two just to see if questions roll in. Um, oh, I do think we've got. Um, oh, just another um, compliment. Nice summary and a lot of great content. One question. What would you consider to be the most effective wedge to get prospective clients interested in sustainable practice? <laughs> well, that's like the question you want to, you ask yourself every time you try to get clients to do sustainable um, practice. And I'll let Nick answer this after I do, because I think architects and engineers will have a different response to this. Um, but I, I think I think we need to let them know what we're doing that is sustainable that they might not even realize that we're doing so that they can start being familiar with what sustainability really means in a project. And I think you just have to constantly remind them, you know, I think you have to educate them so that they understand what it means, what climate change and global warming and the use of carbon means. Um, so that they can really make a choice about it. And you need to help them understand that a lot of these choices they can make um, won't just, um, might cost a little bit money, a little bit of cost in the beginning, but will ultimately save them money in the end. 
Yeah, I mean, kind of expanding on what you just ended with coming from the engineering side is, I mean, that's one of the first things we do on a project when we're trying to push a sustainable system or uh, implementing some of these things that are different than what they're used to doing is that return on investment. And it, like you said, it may cost a little bit up front, but if you can show a quick return on investment, um, when it comes down to a lot of it comes down to money, but you get the benefits on the back end of having that sustainable design and helping the environment. You know, Nick, one thing you didn't say in your presentation, um, but I think is important to mention is when we did that analysis of those fume hoods, um, I think we were saving $65,000 a year in energy costs because of that change to the fume hoods. Did I get that number right? I so, don't remember the exact um, for the fume hoods, but overall this throughout this design, it's $150,000 in savings per year, just below um, a typical lab building. Um, but through changing the 12 inch sash stops, we were able to shift cost from the HVAC system to buy the auto closers. So that's another thing is finding a way to shift cost. If you can increase the envelope and um, get a tighter envelope, you can really hone in the cost of the HVAC system and lower that cost and move that money elsewhere, um, which is some of the things we try to do on this project and on any project we have is um, where can you shift costs by improving uh, one thing. Awesome. Um, and then we have another question. Um, I think we spoke about this as a team beforehand. Um, will the presentation be available? I think we decided that um, we will be sharing a recording of this session, um, but we don't necessarily plan to circulate any slides. Um, Nick, Sarah, I'm sorry if you guys already mentioned this, but do we, uh, can we share your contact information with anyone who might want to reach out with a follow-up question? Absolutely. Yes, I would, absolutely. I'd love to help. Okay, great. Um, got one more question. What has been the feedback from students and professors? I know you did um, give a couple of testimonies there. Did they have a comparison to their previous facility? Um, there, every comment we've gotten from students and professors have been very positive. They really like the natural light. I mean, they were coming from a really terrible facility before this. Um, so it would have been a pretty low bar if we didn't improve it. Um, but I, I think we went up and beyond their expectations for what a new facility can be. And all the comments I've gotten from students and professors have, have said that. Yeah, I, th I think I remember actually having one conversation with a fifth year grad student that the only person I talked to that actually had been in both buildings and he was floored by the new space he had to work in. Well, I can imagine why. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I think that um, concludes the questions that we have. So we'll go ahead and plan to give everybody couple minutes back in their day, but we thank you guys so much for taking the time to put this presentation together and share it with us. And thank everyone for um, being with us this afternoon. So hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. And just please reach out if you would like to um, get contact information for Nick or Sarah. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Sarah.